There is one road in and one road out of the Kimberley town of Derby. Derby in the mid-70s was a very quiet, small country town. Well, like any small town, and there's going to be good stories and bad stories. And like any town, there's going to be secrets. Locals have long memories. Good morning. How are you? It's been almost 50 years since Jimmy Taylor disappeared, but his mother, Evelyn, can't stop thinking about him. This is an old photo. It was taken at my um, auntie's house, Auntie Florence's house. So Jimmy's on the right, Aaron, with his finger in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy was one of nine children. Because of their Aboriginal heritage, their life was governed by the Native Welfare Act. And as was common practice at the time, the siblings were assessed and categorised as half-caste or quarter-caste. According to elder sister Lynn Henderson-Yates, they were poor but happy. We were a struggling family um, and often, you know, we lived in poverty. There wasn't always everything that we needed, um, shoes or whatever. But um, we weren't different to many other families in town. Jimmy was the middle child, obsessed with Cat Stevens records and full of energy. And he had a very happy, friendly personality. Mm. He is friendly, maybe too friendly, I don't know. Very friendly. He talked to anyone, adults and all that, you know, men and all that, and women. And he mixed, you know, with everyone. But Jimmy never walked anywhere. He, he used to run. He had this restless energy. You can believe that he actually wanted to go to the shop for mum because he had this energy. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, mum, I'll go to the shop. And um, I can still remember that. It was a sunny afternoon in August when Jimmy vanished. This is Nosley uh, Street East, and this is the street that we lived on. Uh, when Jimmy went missing. Um, it was a, a dirt street and this was all native welfare houses and we lived in a native welfare house in this spot where this house is now. Lynn was 17 years old at the time. She remembers Jimmy volunteering to go to the local store to buy some snacks and cool drink. So what do you know about Jimmy's movements here on that day? He would have walked up the path along the main road and this was all vacant, so he would have walked down here up to this shop, what was then the shop, uh, Louis' store, to go and buy the things that um, Mum needed. A few minutes after leaving the store, Jimmy was seen by a woman who lived just up the road. He uh, left the shop, turned left onto the main road, uh, walked down that path, and um, we understand that a vehicle uh, pulled up and spoke to Jimmy through the window and Jimmy put his box in the back of this um, vehicle and uh, jumped into the passenger seat. A few days later, Jimmy's parents reported him missing at the local police station just up the road. But it seems as though very little was done in the way of formal searches at the time. Because the family was Aboriginal, the view seemed to be that Jimmy had just gone walkabout or gone bush. And while the family don't want to dwell on the issue of race, they believe it was a significant factor in the response in the crucial few days after Jimmy went missing. The fact that we lived in native welfare houses, the fact we went for ration orders, the fact that um, the police knew everyone in town. They knew everyone's family story. And I don't think they placed much importance on our family. Detective Superintendent Rowan Ingalls oversees cold case investigations for the WA police force and agrees things could have been done better. Look, when you look back at this, being completely honest, I would like a lot more to have been done at the time. But it wasn't, and he was treated as a missing person. Now, in today's environment, a 12-year-old who goes missing, that would be treated with a, a greater deal of urgency. As the weeks dragged on, the family did their best to search the town. We had no vehicle. 
Um, we lived way down the other end of town, so all the searching that we did was done on foot um, and by word of mouth. For years, little happened. Reported sightings of Jimmy could never be confirmed and rumours swirled around town about who was involved. The family's frustration at the lack of police action grew and in 2013 they had a breakthrough. WA Police conducted a review of the case, which triggered an inquest. A coronial inquest has begun in Derby into the disappearance of a 12-year-old boy in the town 40 years ago. The inquest in 2014 produced a new witness who also reported seeing Jimmy getting into a vehicle with a mystery man. And it was a chance to hear directly from the man the family considered to be the most likely suspect. James Ryan O'Neill was living in the Kimberley town at the time James Jimmy Taylor went missing from Derby in 1975. James O'Neill, shown here in an ABC documentary, was a convicted child killer. This I cannot say. He'd been working on cattle stations in the Derby area at the time Jimmy went missing. O'Neill gave evidence to the inquest denying any involvement in the boy's disappearance. The coroner concluded that Jimmy Taylor had most likely died, but said it wasn't possible to know how the death occurred or the cause of death. In recent years, a second suspect has emerged. In 2020, a man named John Bodie was convicted of sexually assaulting more than a dozen boys in Derby in the 1970s and 80s. When the family heard the news, they realised the paedophile had been living just a couple of houses away from them at the time Jimmy disappeared. When we heard about um, Bodie just recently um, and the terrible things he did, we were really shocked. We couldn't believe it. Then we thought, well, hang on. Those two men are now in jail. They are still alive. My mother is still alive. We are still alive. So the urgency is there that we try and get some answers from these two men about what might have happened to Jimmy. Look, I'm not going to go into detail in relation to suspects in this matter. What I will say, the two gentlemen you've mentioned have been interviewed and we are certainly aware of their existence. Jimmy's disappearance has never generated as much attention as some other missing children. I think there's, there's still, I call it the great silence around Jimmy. There's no, you felt you weren't of any worth, weren't important enough for there to be more concentrated help in trying to solve his case. And also that, um, that really we had no voice. If they thought he had gone walkabout, that tells you how important they viewed the case. The family are now pinning their hopes on a fresh campaign by the WA police force to solve dozens of cold cases. Okay, so we've got, uh, Detective Sherry Inspector King. Rowan Ingalls says his team pushed for Jimmy Taylor to be on the list because it's believed foul play was involved. 1975. I definitely believe there are people out there who know some information in relation to the disappearance of Jimmy. I appeal to them to come forward Tell us what they know. Give us a chance to provide closure to the family. Is there a little bit, maybe in all of you, that holds on to hope that he might be alive, or is that gone? We went through a period of years thinking, well, what if he did run away? Then we realised, no, he didn't run away, for the reasons that I've said. And we believe he actually was um, picked up by... a a predator in town and things happen to him. Evelyn is growing frail. I'm always thinking lately. I think I've thought about, missed him more and more as the years went by. But, you know, I keep thinking, what happened to Jimmy? Jimmy, what, where are you, you know? His life was of value. He was important. Every life is of value, but a child's life is of, a, of greater value. So he deserves all of our attention. He, he deserves not to be forgotten.